and so I'm going to go to two portions of scripture, one in Leviticus chapter 20 and the other in Romans chapter 1. If you will just stand uh, with me, Leviticus chapter 20 and verse 13. If a man also lie with mankind as he lieth with a woman, both of them have committed an abomination. They shall surely be put to death. Their blood shall be upon them. And then in Romans chapter 1, Verse 24, wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lusts of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. For this cause God gave them up unto vile affections for even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. And likewise also the men leaving the natural use of the woman, burning their lusts one toward another, men with men working that which is unseemly and receiving into themselves the, that recompense of their error which was meat. And then verse 28, and even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. The Bible and homosexuality. God bless you. you may be seated. So we're going to conclude then the few remarks that I had regarding the Bible and homosexuality. And this is the fourth part. And in as much as it has not been an exhaustive study by any means, yet I hope that I've highlighted and showed you the voice of the Holy Scriptures regarding the unanimous voice with which the Word of God speaks showing God's absolute condemnation of homosexual practice. There is unanimity in scripture, and the scripture is with one voice. There is no division. All scriptures, when we examine them, says the same thing in regards to the homosexual practice. There is not one positive thing that is said about same-sex um, intercourse in scripture. It is always met with universal condemnation. In the setting in Leviticus, homosexuality is grouped with at least five other things. It's grouped with fornication, adultery, prostitution, incest, and bestiality. And there is no one who will make a case to support any of these. Not a single person will support bestiality, incest, prostitution, adultery, and so forth. Not, not, not a person. And if that's the case, why then would anyone try to make a case to support homosexuality? It's in the same group, same setting. And of course, we simply cannot make a case to support it. So tonight I'm going to put my finger on four things as we conclude our study. First, what is the homosexual agenda? Number two, how do we deal with the eight passages of scripture that are clearly against homosexuals? Number three, some suggestion as to the cause what are the causative agents? And number four, our response to homosexuals. 
and then I trust that we will have enough time for us to do a Q&A. Firstly, what is the homosexual agenda? And you know that in this country at this time, and I had made mention in our study that there is probably about 3.4% and probably even less of the population that call themselves homosexual. And yet, clearly, that is the agenda that is driving the bus in this country. So what is that agenda? Well, let us turn first to the Genesis chapter 1 and verse 28. Genesis chapter 1 verse 28. And God blessed them, that is Adam and Eve, and God said unto them, Be fruitful, and multiply, and replenish the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over it, the fish, and the sea, and so forth. And then also in Genesis chapter 9 and verse 1, it says the same, the same verbiage is used there. And God blessed Noah and his son. This is after the the flood and they've come out now out of that boat and said unto them be fruitful same verbiage here be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth so god's design both from the early genesis and after the the overthrow of the antediluvian world god's design was to replenish the earth was to populate the earth. The Bible says he made it to be inhabited. And of course, Satan's design is to combat that wish of God. And so, nowhere can it be shown or supported that same-sex relationship can produce an offspring, naturally. It didn't matter how much sexual activity between a man and a man, it simply cannot produce an offspring. The same thing goes for a woman. Woman to woman can't. And so we see then what they're trying to, what Satan is trying to do, get people to do, is to rebel against God. And so we, we, we would ask a very plausible question. What would have happened to the human species if our first, say, 100 people were all homosexuals? And of course, the answer would, we would have lost the human species. And so you can see how diabolical it is when Satan is, is prodding people to go into that line of activity so the design then of the devil is simply to oppose god it is rebellion so homosexuality is pure and simple open rebellion against god and people can try and and say this they can couch it here they can make an argument there but it's simply against god and and i have found there is not a battle you can win if you're fighting God, you always lose. Secondly, how do homosexuals deal with the clear teachings of God's word? Since it is clear, there's no ambiguity, there is, there's, there's no uh, dark saying, it can't be misinterpreted, how do they deal with it? Well, the short answer is that they twist scripture. They rest scripture. They do violence to scripture in order somehow to let scripture fit with their perversion. Notice, if you will, if you'll bring this up in the New Living Translation, this is a little better um, able to understand. Second Peter chapter 3 and verse 16. When people rest or twist or do violence to scripture, all kind of calisthenic you've got to do over that in order to support what you're thinking. 2 Peter 3.16. And Peter is talking about the Apostle Paul and his writing to the various saints. He says, some of his comments 
are hard to understand. And those who are ignorant and unstable have twisted a rest. Twisted his letters to mean something quite different, just as they do with other parts of scripture. And you observe, and this will result in their destruction. So when they twist or do violence or rest scripture, it's not that they're going to get away with it. It's that destruction is lingering. I'm going to list at least eight scriptures that shows and condemn the practice of homosexuality. Genesis 19, 4 to 11. And that deals with Sodom and Gomorrah, of course. Then Leviticus 18, 22. Leviticus 20, 13 that we've read. Deuteronomy 23, verse 17. Judges 19, 22 to 25. And this, this judge's scripture is, is quite similar to the encounter with Lot down in Sodom. Almost same kind of scenario, same kind of setting, same kind of response. Number six, Romans chapter one, verses 26 through 27. Seven, First Corinthians chapter six, verse nine and 10. And then lastly, number eight, First Timothy chapter one, verse nine verses 9 and 10. Now one of their main arguments against Old Testament texts that condemned uh, homosexuality, they said, well, Jesus destroyed the law. And that the modern, the modern day homosexual are not subject to the constraints of the law. Well, sometimes people are either silly, stupid, or just willingly ignorant. And sometimes all three applies. First of all, Jesus did not condemn the law. If you look in Matthew chapter 5, verse 17, to 20, you'll see that absolutely he did not come to destroy the law. Think not. Here's what Jesus says. Matthew quotes Jesus as saying, Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot, that's almost insignificant part of the Hebrew, one jot or one till shall in no wise pass from the law, Till all be fulfilled. Whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments and teach men so, he shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I say unto you that except your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, you shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. So, Jesus did not come to destroy the law, but rather to fulfill. There were three parts of the Mosaic law. The one part that was fulfilled, not destroyed, were the ceremonial part. The ceremonial part that talks about the Passover and the various washings and offering. All of those are fulfilled in Jesus Christ. They were not, they were not abrogated. They were not done away with. They were not, they were not thrown out. They were simply, the, the law served as a shadow, and Jesus then is the exact thing. So they are fulfilled in Jesus. All of the other laws, the moral law, and the, 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 the moral law is still in effect. The same thing that he wrote, and that we normally call it the Decalogue, still in effect. Nothing wrong with that. Shouldn't covet, that's still in effect. Shouldn't bear false witness. That's still right. Nothing wrong with that. But when people want to do wrong, they're going to 
twist scripture. They're going to do violence to scripture. They're going to do all kinds of calisthenics over scripture. And so, what they're thinking is just, well, we hope Jesus condemned those, but we're not sure. Well, when you go up to heaven, you think you're going to just plead mercy and go into heaven? No, no, friend. You go to that white throne judgment and you're not right, it's not going to work. There's no place for repentance there. So they say, well, Jesus condemned Old Testament scriptures. Then they argue that if Paul knew about the loving, committed relationship that exists among them, then he would support it. Well, there's no evidence for that. So, well, you know, in our homosexual relationship, it's so loving and committed. It is bunk. It's just plain bunk. Plain baloney in our modern vernacular. There's more violence among that community than, than, than any place else. There's no loving, committed relationship there. There is simply no evidence, and Paul says this. Pull up for me Romans chapter 7, verse 14. Romans chapter 7 and verse 14. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am called and sold under sin. So as far as the law goes, as far as Paul goes, He's not going to support that. And then if you pull up also verses uh, 26 and 7 of Romans chapter 1. Because they say, well, Paul will support what they're about if he knew how committed they were to each other. For this cause, God gave them up to vile affections. So that Paul calls it vile affections. For even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. And likewise also the men leaving the natural use of the woman, burning their lust one toward another, men with men working that which is unseemly. So it's unseemly. And then receiving into themselves that recompense of their error, which was meat, or which was commensurate with what they did. And you will see that when studies are observed, many in the homosexual community live 30 to 35 years less than in the heterosexual community. So there's nothing good about that. You look at statistics. Then they say Old Testament texts, they don't have to obey. They said Paul would support it. And then thirdly, they said, well, the Genesis text and the Judges text passages that I've alluded to had only to do with gang rape. I said all that God was just angry about gang rape, but there's no evidence. Because if you recall, Lot offered his two daughters. And they said, well, no, wait, no, we don't want the daughters, no. We want, the, we want those two angels. And, and of course, Genesis chapter 19, verse 8, put a damper on this argument also. If you pull up that for me, Genesis chapter 19, verse 8. Behold, now I have two daughters which have not known men. Let me, I pray you, bring them out unto you, and, ye, and, and do ye to them as it's good in your eyes. Only unto these men do nothing, for therefore came they under the shadow of my roof. Um, that's fine, thank you. So this business about um, it was just gang rape it is just nonsense. But as people do, they do da damage and violence to scripture just to try and support what they really want. Thirdly, some suggestions as to the cause of homosexuality. 
There are many suggestions as to the causative agents here. And I'm going to mention uh, a few of them and give a brief explanation. Smother mothers. I'll talk a little bit more that, about that. Dis, number two, distant dads. Number three, generational sin. And fourth, the devil. You know, if, if people can't do something, they just said, well, as Flip Wilson did say, the devil made me do it. But people have to take responsibility. You can't blame the devil all, all the time. Now, psychologists have pointed to a number of factors that help to shape the homosexual behavior. Children are more likely to become homosexual if they're not able to identify with their same-sex parents, but become excessively attached to the opposite sex parent. For example, if a father is physically absent from that home because the, the ideal the ideal setting where children are brought forth is a home that has two parents, a mom and a dad. And those two parents, of course, they are going to fulfill different roles. And one of the purpose, of course, is for the children to identify themselves in their mom and dad. So if the dad is absent for a protracted time, a long time within the, the home, then there is a tendency for that boy, for instance, to be somewhat attracted to that mom. Or if he is in a house that there, there is a lot of abuse, the dad is abusive. Or if the dad is an ineffectual father and he's weak, or if there's fear and hatred towards that dad, there is a greater chance that his son will identify with his mother. The same thing can happen when a mother is extremely affectionate, i.e. A, sm a smother mother. She's affectionate but controlling and domineering, same effect. In these situations, what's happened, as, as the studies have showed, the boy may become more identified, more likely to identify with the female role. So you hear somebody says that it's a man, it's a, it's a female trapped in a man's body. So if he is, the, the dad is away, the dad is abusive, the dad is not effective, the da dad has a lot of anger issues, then the, the, the boy the, is very fearful and so forth, then he is going to be identifying himself with his mother. And he is going to be more feminine than masculine. Also, early childhood sexual experience can shape the behavior later, especially if it was perceived to be normal or if it was pleasurable. I.e., for instance, if, if, if a, a, a male was molested by another male, and that happens in a lot of cases. Or if you had an early love affair that ended badly, and as a result of that, that relationship, maybe an Ill illegitimate child was born or there was abortion, and, and that, this may cause uh, a fueling of rejection. And that boy may feel guilt and fear. And this can push that guy, that little guy, that adolescence away from the female attraction and then be turned towards the male. All of that seemed to predispose a guy towards homosexuality. Another thing that they have showed in studies 
as if they are as alienation or ridicule from their peers can do also drive that adolescent into the relationship with homosexuals. So if, 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 if that male a child is at school and maybe has something that is maybe unique to him, maybe he's overweight or whatever the case, then he can be, be alienated from his peers and be driven into a homosexual relationship. And so maybe they may poke fun at him, ridicule him. That tends also to drive them towards homosexuality. So there, 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 there seem to be some kind of, of support in terms of cause there. But of course, it's not really what we're talking about. That's not our main thrust. Our main thrust is not so much to show the cause as it is to show that God can deliver people from that kind of a mindset and that kind of thinking. I'm not here just to talk about the cause and cause and effect. We're not here about to talk about that. We're showing that God is able to deliver people from sinful practices and that God is able to bring them to more normative behavior where they can be saved because all of scripture there is there is there is no there is no ambiguity at all is that a homosexual practice if they continue to do that they are not going to be saved the bible says they shall not inherit the kingdom of god so they can have all the homosexual church they want when they practice that they are not going to heaven the evidence to date showed that that is Homosexual, uh, homosexuality is a learned behavior and it is happening by choice. And it has nothing to do with genetics. All of the studies show that it has nothing at all to do with genetics. And so if someone said, well, God made me that way, that's a lie. That will send you to hell. I was born that way. No, you weren't. That's not a lie that will send you to hell. So these folks are in ter terrible shape and is in need of help because sometimes many of them are delusional. I don't know if um, somewhere along the line they're going to say that, come up to God and say, well, you made me that way, and I don't know how they're going to win that argument. But they simply need to say, come to God and say, Lord, I need you to help me to get out of where I am. And sometimes they say, well, there are many, and, and I don't know, all those young people that's going over the fellowship, fellowship hall, can you check and see why they're going over there? If they don't have a plausible reason in here, bring them right up to the front right here. They said, well, many, many musicians or people, they, when you talk about uh, personalities and so forth, they, they say, well, um, if you have such and such a personality, that means you're homosexual. Well, that's not true either. Because we've got many gifted musicians and artists, such as Bach or Michelangelo. We've got sculptors, we've got scientists, we've got inventors, we've got all kind of philosophers. All of these folk have melancholy temperament, but, but, but more than 80% of these are not homosexual at all. So that's not causative. That's not cause and effect. There, there's nothing there. People are going to do something because they choose to do it, because they want to do it. But they, they, they cannot give God any kind of plausible answer. For instance, I mean, there's some family that have, that have a lot of alcoholics in it. Or any kind of problem, thieves or whatever. It doesn't mean that all of their family members has to be alcoholics or thieves. No. 
I mean, there may, be, there may be a predisposition because of what they see. They may be inclined to be an alcoholic if their, their dad drink from the, the, the day the sun comes up till the sun goes down. They may see that. And they may, be, they may have an inclination to do that. There may be a predisposition to do that, but they don't have to do it. Because there's nothing genetically driving that, that toward, towards that kind of lifestyle. So we simply cannot talk about anything about genetic, genetic or, or their temperament. People may be simply predisposed to something, but it doesn't mean that they have to be like that. And so then, I think that as, as parents, then we have to maybe look at some of the, the, the studies that have been um, postulated and put forth, and then we have to consider some remedy. If, for instance, a young guy has a proclivity towards being a homosexual, if the dad is absent from his life or if the dad is abusive or if the dad has anger issues if that is the case then dads just have to change the way they do things because if that's going to push their sons towards homosexuality then the dad need to stay around the house and he needs to be involved in the life of those little guys That dad need to take those little guys to the park, play ball, climb the oak tree, fall out of the oak tree, break the arm, the arm, put a splint on and put him back out there. Don't, don't, I mean, you, you don't want their mom to train them to be sissies. Lord have mercy. This is an apostolic church, I know. One of the one of the things that is is so alarming to me is having the little guys all closeted, cooped up in the house. They go to school, there's no recess. When we were growing up as boys, we had recess. We had time to go out and let out steam. Knock things down, break things. Break our wrists, break our legs. These guys, they're just closeted, they're on their iPads, they're playing some video games, they are eating potato chips on the couch, sitting around doing nothing. Well, and, and, and you're just going to have the moms there, you're going to produce some, some funny looking guys, going to walk kind of funny, do funny things. So dads need to be involved with them. Don't be absent. Be observant. Because if the statistic, if the statistic is showing that, then you need to be there. And then you don't want to scare them by anger. If you've got anger issues, Deal with it and get rid of it. Your, your little boys don't need to see that anger. You need to take it outside, bury it, have the funeral, have the ceremony, and leave it there. You don't need to be angry with them. Because that's going to push them over the edge. So dads need to be involved. And mothers must not be smotherers. Don't you be smothering those little guys. Back off them. Move away. Go get something to get engaged in doing something else. Leave those guys. Don't train them to be sissies. Let them walk right. Let them can walk like a man. Don't walk kind of funny. What kind of walk is that? Stop. Holding their hand like this. What, what is that? 
Some mothers don't need to smother those little guys. They don't need it. As soon as they fall down, they're running over there. Leave them alone. I don't know if there's a, a mother's instinct to do that, but don't do it. Force yourself not to do that. You can do that to your daughters, but leave the little guys. And then, of course, the mothers not only do that, then they control every decision that that guy is going to make. He's in high school, he's in college. She has to be the one that dominate and make it. Stop doing that. You don't need to do that. If you don't have anything else to do, find something. Let that guy grow up and make some decision. Don't be just hovering over him like a mother hen. And then fourthly, what is our response then to the homosexual practice? Our response is identical to everything, anything else. If people are doing something wrong, we have one remedy, repentance. In Acts chapter 17, Paul said in verse 30 that God has commanded men everywhere to repent. So whether it's homosexual practice or whether it's lying or stealing or whatever kind of wrong thing, then he commands one thing is that men ought to repent. And repentance means a change of mind, a change of disposition, a turning around. You're heading in one direction. When you repent, you turn around. If you used to lie, when you repent, you quit lying. If you used to steal, when you repent, you quit stealing. In the text in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, the apostle lists a whole litany of sins in verse 9 and 10. And then in verse 11, he said, and such were some of you. Such were some of you, and that includes the abusers of themselves with mankind, which is, the, which is the male male, and the effeminate one, he said, they, they were the effeminate, he said, they, that was on that list. So all of the, the effeminate, which is the, um, the female male, and the male male, some of those saints in the Corinthians church were like that. But God washed them after they repented. So nobody has an excuse to say God would made me that way. God did not make it just that way. We learned that. Whether from childhood, when we're pushed in that direction because of how our parents were. But Paul says such were some of you, but you're washed. So that means every homosexual can be washed and cleaned up and sanctified and justified by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ in the name of his word. Everyone. So we don't have any excuse. Such were some of you. But you're washed. And if God washed the Corinthians people from homosexuality, he can wash Americans from homosexuality. Because the same God in Corinth Church is the same God in Canada and in, Ca and in the Americans or in South America or is that, uh, in Australia, wherever it is, God can do the same work because it's the same God. And your people are not going to make some argument that the God in 2013 is weaker than the one in the first century because he is not weaker. He is the same God. He doesn't change. So we tell them they need to repent. The Bible said godly sorrow works repentance. And after you have repented and you have been baptized in water for the remission of your sin in the name of Jesus Christ and you have received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost, with the evidence of speaking in tongues, this is this new, new heart, then after that has taken place, then you stay away from where homosexual frequent. You stay out of that atmosphere. I had a man some time ago, he had been one out of the street 
and for, by street ministry and and of course sometimes there's always a desire to go back and convert those from where you came well just be careful because sometimes you go back into that same atmosphere and you get caught up in that same stuff that God took you from. So if God delivered you from smoking marijuana, you don't want to go back into that place, some drug den trying to win those people because you may not get out of there alive. Just stay away. Let people go that know what's what and not and not not have never been taken over by that, those kinds of things so you stay out of the atmosphere if you know some places where a lot of those people are don't just don't go there and then delete all of those names out of your phone contacts delete them don't need to call them and then you stay full of the holy ghost full of the holy ghost come to church never miss a church every time the doors are open you need to be there you need to stay full of the holy ghost stay at that altar sing read your bible stay stay on fire for god and god will keep you out of that out of that terrible lifestyle and when you when you do that god will help you to live a productive life so homosexuality then is simply wrong and all practicing homosexual will go to hell this is a capital issue this is heaven or hell issue you know depending on what you like to eat that's not a, that's not something that will send you to hell if somebody likes um some some folk like like pork or something well, that won't send you to hell. Somebody may say, well, you know, we're not supposed to eat pork. Well, maybe if you don't like it, that's, that's a conviction. You know, somebody said, well, you know, pork were, was banned under the, the Old Testament system. Well, it was, it was banned because um, God is showing us to make some choice. <coughs> But in the New Testament, it says every creature of God is good and nothing, nothing to be refused. If, it'll be re if it is, if is, if is received with thanksgiving and prayer. So if they said, well, you know, pork, and, and somebody said, well, you know, you, you remember in the, in the scripture that um, all those demons went into the pork. Well, my, my, my answer is all of them drown. So these now, they don't have any demons in them. So if you, if you are so inclined to eat pork, well, go ahead and eat it. That's just a matter of your conviction. So that's a choice. That's not a capital offense. I heard one group who were sworn to not to eat pork. And um, they were in a place that the only thing they had was pork. And so they became hungry, but the only thing there was, was pork. And one bright guy, he spoke up and said, man, come on, let's baptize this joker right here and eat him. So that's what they did. So sometimes necessity will force your hand. But when we talk about homosexuality, that's a capital offense and it'll send you to hell if you engage in it. Okay, and so we're, we're pretty much done. I probably had a few more remarks, but if anyone has a question, you can uh, come right up here and ask that question because th this, this thing, homosexuality, is not going away anytime soon. It, it is driving the bus in this country, but the church has to speak with absolute authority and absolute clarity we can't just but hum and haw this is scripture and it has to we've got to um indeed um agree with scripture go ahead sister. yes sir are there any uh practical things that the church as a body can do for a, um a boy who has been raised by a single mom because 
so we can't force the yeah. father to change. Yeah. I think that, thank you, Sister Terrica. I think that's a, that's a, a, a very um, cogent question. Uh, I know we, we, we've started <coughs> our mentoring program. And uh, maybe the mentoring program is not up to where it's, it's going to be. But that is probably the best uh, suggestion for single mothers. And then we will have to then identify those men who would be able to take some of these youngsters under uh, his wings and then do things with that little guy that dad needs to do. And is that, is that a commitment? Yeah, it's a commitment. It's, it, it really is, uh, it will be a labor of love, however, when you, when you see these little guy turn out the right way. And to me, that, is, that really is the, the answer. If, if that won't work, then I think you, um, maybe some of the, the single ladies would ha then have to approach uh, some of our brothers who are, who are model citizens in the church and then ask them if they could do that. But on a church-wide basis, it would, it would fall under the mentoring program. And I'm going to, we're going to probably in, in the, um, the latter part of the fall, the, the fourth quarter, we're going to be augmenting our current mentoring program to really speak to that issue. And, and so we just need more good men to really be willing to volunteer their time because uh, those men are going to have to take those, those little guys and, and, um, and, and really train them and, and do things that um, fathers are supposed to do with, with, their, with their sons. And that, that a, a son cannot learn from his mom what the dad's supposed to teach because a mom is not a, a dad. And a mom can only supply what she is um, and can't supply the dad. That's why you have a dad. So I think that is, that is the thrust of what we're going to do. Any, anything else? Oh, yes, sir. Yes. You got to have it in your heart to do it. You got to see a vision of doing it. Because if you don't, you're going to have sex and your kids still going to get away from it. <coughs> that is true. He has to, to want to do that. Um, let, let me just maybe just uh, ask this question then. Um, how many, how many of our, our men, our brothers that, um, would like to be a big brother and, and mentor some of the, the, the little guys, the fours, the five-year-olds, and so forth. Okay, so we've got, we got two there. We've got two here. Okay, so we, we, we've, got, we, we've got quite a, quite a few. So now, once we get that, them all uh, peered and, and um, put in the right group, now, as Elder Dudley was saying, this, this has to really be consistent. Because you, you, if you start off with one little guy and you become involved with him, you can't really just jettison him. Like, you can't just say, forget about it. You know, this thing is too much work. Because once, once there is some kind of bonding, then you have to stick with it. <laughs> so, you know, you have, to, you have to be committed to the long haul. It's not just... For a month, it really is for a, probably a lifetime until uh, you know until you you wean him somewhere. But it's going to be for a long time. So we're gonna we're gonna try that. Now I can I can see where you know some of our mothers may get a little frustrated if 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 some of us really don't help out because she really she's going to try as best as she can, but she simply cannot be a dad. Um, 
Any, anything else? All right. Well, we're going we're gonna to get us a song. And uh, I, I trust that when this kind of a uh, subject comes up, then I think we should have had enough information to really answer any questions that people would ask us. If you, if you were absent during the, um, the, the three previous sessions, then I would suggest that maybe you get the, C, the C, a CD of it or, or something and, and then um, follow some of the, the information there and at least you will be able to um, answer question in, in a coherent manner. Um, it's it really um, a subject that is really not going to go away. The, the Supreme Court weighed in a couple weeks ago. There's courts over in California. The only state so far that is willing to buck the trend of our society is Texas. Everybody else is going in the direction of, of just saying, well, you know, we don't want to be hard. We don't want to seem like we are just really um, just not considerate of other people. We need to consider people's feeling and we can't be judgmental and all those kinds of things. And so it's not going to go away. There are preachers that have gone to prison for that. And they may call it a hate crime or whatever else they're going to couch it under. But that's something that we have to be willing to stand up. Here is what God says. And here is what we believe. And if we should be incarcerated over it, then we go in there and preach it in the prison. I mean, the, the worst case scenario is that they kill us. And if they kill us, we but just die. Hallelujah. Let's stand.